Welcome to the Longevity Week podcast, hosted by the Longevity Forum. We will be featuring podcasts all week on the theme, The Age of Resilience, which you can catch online at longevityforum.com. Today, Dr. Claire Mellon, renowned obstetrician, and Rebecca Gibbs, fellow gynecologist and ambassador to the DAISY Network, will be interviewing Nicole Shanahan on longevity and its impacts on fertility. Nicole is the president of Bia Echo Foundation, which focuses on investing in change makers at the forefront of reproductive longevity and equality, criminal justice reform, and a healthy and livable planet. She also was CEO of Clear Access IP, an integrated patent management technology, and is a California attorney. Now I'll leave it to you, Claire. Hi, Nicole. We're sitting in our London office and we've obviously been interested in finding out a lot about your work. Um, But we thought perhaps we could start with asking you how you got involved with this particular aspect of fertility work and also perhaps if you could sort of outline what's new in the world of longevity. Sure, happy to. So I initially came into the longevity field as an intellectual property lawyer and technologist, and I was asked to put together a report on the growing intellectual property landscape as it relates to longevity science. And so at that time, it was, uh, this is about six years ago, and it still remained to be kind of a, a niche group of folks. But this niche group of folks is very passionate about moving this field forward. And so there was a gathering in San Francisco, and I I got on stage and I started to read off a report about longevity patenting trends. And what we found was that there was a huge number of filings in 2014 and 2015 of about, I think it was a 400% from previous five-year period. So clearly there's something going on here. There's lots of new innovation coming out of Asia and Europe and the United States. And we're seeing people really entering the space from the pharma and drug perspective, in addition to nutrition, whereas historically it's really been viewed as a beauty field, people wanting to look younger longer. And so now that I think the field has been over the last really seven year period redefined as being really focused on therapeutics and focused on, you know, really deep cellular health. It's changing both the financing of the longevity space, but also how we think about it in terms of day-to-day life. And have you got any snippets of what would be happening in regards women's health perspective, you know, particularly your work done at the Bucket Institute? When I looked into the space as a patent professional, something happened around that same time. I was being told by doctors I was having waning productive health. And I was 31 at the time when I was told that it would be very challenging for me to conceive. After visiting various IVF clinics, I accidentally landed in the field of reproductive longevity without knowing it at the time. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> um, and so as, as a philanthropist working across other areas like criminal justice reform, I really wanted to see what the financing model was for reproductive longevity research. And I was really dismayed to learn that there's not a lot of activity in the space. In fact, the space of reproductive longevity had not been defined it was not an area that was easy to finance as a philanthropist. So it was during this period about three years ago that I decided to enter the space as a philanthropist. That's great. We as jobbing gynecologists obviously have a lot of very anxious women worried about their fertility. They're delaying their fertility anyway, as you know, and there's a lot of interest in it. The more research, the better in a lot of ways. Do you have any thoughts on from a sort of moral point of view, there's lots of questions that we get asked, as you can imagine, of limiting age with which you can do social egg freezing or the age with which you should be parenting children. Have you got any thoughts on that? Or is it much more the scientific stuff that you're being involved with? 
I think that we have to be careful about getting drawn into the politics of the space. Yeah. Um, Because when you just look at the data, there's a lot of women in their late 20s, early 30s that would make wonderful mothers that can't conceive or having difficulty conceiving. And I mean, we've all seen the chart that shows this rapid decline of reproductive health at the age of 35. Yes. I want to fix that chart before I get into the questions, you know, what I think of really are the edge cases of like a 80 year old woman trying to conceive. I I think that's really. Most of us would understand that, that, but it's it's interesting because we have quite a lot of laws and boundaries and things that make it quite difficult for us to be able to advise women. And I think with more research, we'll probably be able to advise people better. But it's just a case of a young youngster coming in and suggesting that she has her eggs freezing. Um, and we, we've just got to be able to give them the best advice at the moment. And then that changes a lot. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, you know, what would you advise if you had an 18 year old niece, for instance, of, to do with your fertility? If you had your time again, how would you advise yourself? You know, those sort of questions. I think what I wish I knew then that I know now is that chart we're shown is incredibly abstract. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And that the reality is that reproductive health is almost stochastic. It's, I don't want it to be stochastic 50 years from now, stochastic meaning like random. It seems like there are some women who were told they were infertile at the age of 35, that at the age of 42, magically conceive a healthy child. So we need to reframe that chart. We need to reframe the discussion. And I wish that I had known at the age of 18 that reproductive health is more than just an (laughs) age-related phenomenon, but is multivariable. And that Today, while we don't have the diagnostic tools to determine exactly what is dictating our reproductive health, that we have to be open to exploring multiple avenues of discussion. And I wish that I had known that there are pods of people in the world that are dedicated to understanding all of these different approaches from mental, emotional, stress management, to nutrition, to also understanding that there's a developing science occurring and that there's just things doctors don't fully understand yet. No, we do get obsessed by the charts and I think it is much more complicated jigsaw, but it's being able to advise people what the right is and, uh, you know, I have young girls who come in saying I'm waiting for my bonus in, in my or my career break or whatever it is. And I'm, you know, said if you found the right man, go for it, girl. You know, but can I introduce you to Rebecca, who herself has been on a journey, but also is an ambassador for the Daisy Network with uh, women who've had premature ovarian insufficiency. And perhaps you could ask you a question or two. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Rebecca. Of course. Wonderful to meet you. And I am so excited about going back to the members of the Daisy Network to tell them about this incredible woman who is has been through what they've been through and is working to change this. And just thinking a bit about the emotional and resilient side of all of this. How did you cope with your diagnosis with finding out in your late 20s, early 30s that getting pregnant wasn't going to be as you expected. And what would you tell your younger self now if you could go back in time? I think coping is is the right framing of that feeling when you're told that you might not be a mother in your lifetime. Yeah. It's a hard pill to swallow. And I think that the medical field jumped to this conclusion prior than they should have. (laughs) Yep, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. And so there's so many women that have written me since hearing about my story, telling me that they went through a similar experience of doctors telling them their FSH levels were way too high and that, you know, an, an ultrasound 
They didn't have any active follicles. And so the measurements that women have had available to them have, I think, inaccurately colored a picture of what the potential is that is still there. (laughs) Yes, yes, absolutely. And so I, you know, became pregnant about a year and a half after I was told it was never going to happen. And, and I thought, wow, what a miracle. (laughs) This Mm -hmm. is a miracle. (laughs) But as I'm getting the research back from the Buck Institute and others, I'm realizing that there might be periods in your life where you are infertile, but that doesn't mean that's a forever diagnosis. And that had I known that fertility changes given various environmental factors and and medical factors, I I would have suffered a lot less (laughs) than I did. And I think I could have intervened in different ways in my own health. Is there anything in particular? I mean, you touched on nutrition, for instance. And, you know, this, we, have, we actually have an acupuncturist in our office who does work mm. with, I don't particularly understand it, but I <laughs> respect it, if that makes sense. That people are, are realizing that there is more to this Venn diagram of fertility. Is there anything that helped you in particular or that you are interested in that's perhaps less scientific? I'm a big believer in the power of acupuncture. I used it myself um, very regularly. And I now look back on the period of time when I was told I was infertile and I look at what was going on in my life. And a lot of it was, I wasn't caring for myself. I feel as good as I could have. And so I did make changes to my life. I. I started, you know, my day with nutritional techniques for liver cleanses, right? Lots of fruits and vegetables first thing in the morning and things known to really be conduits for liver health. I worked on getting more sleep. (laughs) I, I mean, really simple, simple things that are sometimes really hard to implement in day to day life, but, uh, the sleep helped a lot. And then regular use of acupuncture. And then really, I had gone through kind of many stages of grief. And I think when I had come out of the final stage of grief, of just acceptance and really becoming content with with life and letting go of certain expectations, I started to feel healthier and happier. (laughs) But I don't think that's necessarily what I would hope other women have to go through, I would hope that we could, you know, really save this off for women starting earlier. So, I mean, you you talk about the age of 18. I think that we could really talk about life planning in a more holistic way. I think that's what we, we realized that fertility in the next 10 years is going to involve societal change. And it doesn't mean to say you can't be a mother older, but you need to work out, you know, what, you want out of it all. It's going to be an interesting journey, I think, in the next 10, 15 years with regards to the scientific fact, making it longevity better. But at the same time, what do we do with that time is the important thing. And yeah, and how do we diagnose infertility? I just think right now, it, it's almost like we treat it as if it's eyesight. <laughs> well, we have, and- we have this, this magical AMH that everybody believes in so highly. And I've had many a patient who's got pregnant with a poor AMH when they've relaxed or they've I mean my my trick to say to patient is pretend you're already pregnant and you look after yourself better both emotionally and physically you know that sometimes works but um have you any advice for men out of interest because we know that, that there are going to be quite a lot of older men who want to still have children and and I think we just always assume they're going to be fine but I do have a few they, they don't realize that they can't get people pregnant sometimes and and again, that's multifactorial. But do you have? Are you looking into that from a scientific point of view at the Buck Institute, or is it just predominantly women at the moment? You know, since entering this field, I've been asked about sperm more times than I thought I would ever be asked about sperm <laughs> in my life. And, <laughs> um, and my my reaction is that you know, there's so much about the female reproductive system that I feel deserves 
my full attention that I have not gone into male reproductive science. That's fine. I can understand that. There's so much exactly. And from a feminist viewpoint, thank you for looking at women first. Important. (laughs) Yeah, I, I have some funny stories I can share sometime, but I was at this international gathering of uh, heads of health programs from, from various countries. And it was all men at the table, and, and I was the only woman. And again, I can wax on poetic about female reproductive health and think everyone's listening, but then the first question I get is about sperm. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I asked it, because I thought there might be quite a lot of men listening to this. <laughs> so I thought they'd probably be interested. Great. Is there anything else that you feel that we ought to know? Is there anything, any breakthroughs that are not published yet that we would like to know about? Or Oh, there's so many exciting things. I'm going to let the buck do the publishing, yeah. but I will say that effectively we've redefined this field over the last two years. They, These researchers leading the work out of the buck have have really figured out how to approach the science in new ways. And I think this is going to set in path a new diagnostic practice in medical offices and fertility clinics. And so I think the breakthroughs are that this is not just about having a baby. This is really about lifelong health for women. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that this is the path to kind of combat the fact that this has been an underserviced area of medicine for so long. I'm a trustee of the Wellbeing of Women, which is a um, research charity for women's health, and it's very underfunded. I've managed to persuade Jim to be quite an active member, luckily. <laughs> um, so we're, we're getting there. But but actually, you know, management of many menopause, management of menopause generally, you know, management of fertility, there are lots of aspects that I think we really, really need some extra research into in the next 10 years. would be fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work in the space. Thank you. (laughs) This broadcast has been brought to you by the Longevity Forum. As part of Longevity Week 2020, we are very grateful to our sponsors, Juvenescence, Bill Dickinson, and Burnbray. For more podcasts, visit our website, thelongevityforum.com, or follow us on Twitter, longevity underscore forum.